Hi guys, welcome back to A Dinosaur in the Library. I'm Dawn and I'm here to ramble about books. Specifically, I'm here to do a short review of this book. Um, I mentioned this in my What I've Been Reading video and this is The Rise of Women, The Growing Gender Gap in Education and What It Means for American Schools by Thomas A. Dupreet and, or Dupret, I'm not sure which, and Claudia Buckman. So this is not what typically gets reviewed on booktube, but I want to talk about this book because it really ticked me off and you people are book people and I can't yell and scream about books with too many people. So we're going to talk about this book. So I'm taking a class right now called Gender and Education in Comparative Perspective. And we're talking about different gender theories and things like this. And this is the first book we're reading. We've been reading articles up till now. And the book is all about how, despite the fact that women are still at a disadvantage in many ways um, in U.S. culture, it, it's mainly a U.S.-based um, focused book, but I think some of it is generalizable to in, at least industrialized countries. I don't know how much it would transfer to non-industrialized countries. Um, but um, even though women are disadvantaged, they are actually receiving more uh, bachelor's degrees and doing better in schools than boys are. So right now, like, or at least when this book was published, which was in 2013, um, there were 58% of bachelor's degrees were being awarded to women. And girls have been doing better in elementary and middle and high school for multiple years, despite, um, you know, reports to the contrary. They're actually making better grades and better test scores than boys. And the book is all about why that is, um, or supposed to be about why that is and what causes this and how we can address it and things like this. So I went into this a little, you know, hesitant simply because education, um, graduate, graduate education for the field of education is a much different creature than the departments I'm usually in. So they are very, poli a lot of times they're very policy focused. There's a lot um, dealing with numbers, a lot of quantitative stuff. And that's what this book is. This book is heavy on policy and heavy on quantitative. And for what people in my class who are in education say, it's a pretty typical policy book. Um, and in fact, they said that it's actually a pretty decent policy book. And I think that's really what upset me is when they said that, because let me tell you, okay, there's, there's multiple things in here that bother me, but there are two specific problems I've had with this book, um, that really, really ticked me off. The first one is they're talking about how, um, African American males are less represented in higher education. Okay. And, they're attributing part of that to the higher rate of African-American males being incarcerated. And I can't argue with the fact that, at least in the U.S., for sure, there is rampant industry, um, institutionalized and systematic racism involved in our justice system. That's just a fact. Um, if you know anything about U.S. politics or U.S. current events, you will know that this has been in the news quite a bit um, with police brutality, multiple instances of this, especially toward African-American people. And, I mean, they are incarcerated more. But here's where the issue comes. They say that they got pretty accurate um, demographic information for prisons. So, you know, race that sort of thing. But they couldn't get the same sort of information for jail populations. And I was like, okay, so they're just not going to talk about jail populations. No, they literally say that they just made the assumption that jail and prison populations are equivalent. Therefore, the, you know, they can use the same statistics for them. This is so problematic, guys. Um, the easiest way to explain this is jail populations are typically, you know, city and county jails, things like this, that the people in them may not have been charged with anything yet. They may just be serving some short time for whatever they were arrested for, or they may be waiting to go to, to court, um, waiting to be charged, or they may have had the resources to hire themselves excellent legal representation and may never see the inside of a prison and are instead serving 
time in the county or city jail. Which brings up a lot of issues of class and a lot of issues of race and a lot of issues of privilege and multiple other issues. And they just gloss over that. They're just like, oh, no. Similar populations, we're just going with this. No, you cannot do that. That just does not sound kosher. And I am no expert in the populations of jails and prisons. I am no expert on those things. But that just in intrinsically sounds wrong, the way that they just glossed over the possibility of there being differences. Um, and even in their discussion of the demographics they had, there wasn't really any in-depth coverage of the class differential there. I mean, I think we can all agree that lower socioeconomic status people tend to be um, incarcerated more than higher. And a lot of that has to end for longer simply because they have more, res the higher uh, income people have more resources. There's, I mean, you there's not a whole lot to argue with there. That's just numbers. Um, the second thing that really takes me off also had to do with class. So... A little bit further on in the book, which we haven't discussed this section in class yet. We're discussing it on Tuesday, and I look for it to be a pretty heated discussion because I am really angry about this. So they're talking about this survey that was done of parents um, asking them what they valued um, in their kids in terms of education. So they assumed that higher higher educated parents, who are also typically higher income parents, would value um, better grades more than the other aspects than the lower educated slash lower income parents. Well, what actually happened is lower income parents were shown to um, place more importance on getting good grades than they were on leadership and outside activities. Higher educated, higher income parents placed importance upon grades, but we're actually more interested in the leadership and other activities. And they made the statement in the book that lower income parents or lower educated parents don't understand the value of leadership building activities and extracurricular um, involvement. Okay. Extracurricular activities and these leadership building activities typically cost money. You know what doesn't cost money? The effort you put in to make good grades. Therefore, lower income parents are probably going to, uh, to put more importance on those because that's something they can push their kids to do. If you don't have the money to get your kid involved in leadership building activities or a lot of extracurricular activities, you can very easily impart to them that getting good grades, doing your homework, and putting in the effort is the most important thing because that doesn't cost you anything. And that puts your kid, in your mind, at a better advantage for potentially getting scholarships and going to college, right? So they make no mention of this. They make no mention of the fact that lower educated parents typically are lower income therefore won't have the money to get their kids involved in these so-called leadership activities, right? If you're higher income, you've pretty much potentially got the money, depending on your situation and the number of children or whatever, you've potentially got the money to pay the fees for these kids to do these activities. Lower income parents don't. And Therefore, that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't understand, which I felt was really condescending, that they don't understand the value of them. They simply understand that their money only goes so far. And the things that don't cost any money are the things that need to be focused upon um, when it comes to things like this. So, yeah. I mean, there were other things in this book that I found problematic and kind of took issue with. But those were the two main things. So, yeah, this book is probably getting dropped to a one star. I did a two and a half star. And then I was making notes for class before I was doing this video. And I realized, you know, really? One star is pretty generous compared, you know, considering the, the issues with this. Um, if you've read this book 
or you know more about educational policy books than I do and you want to have a discussion about this, please comment below. I would love to have a discussion about this book because, as I said, I will fully admit that I do not have an expertise in educational policy or anything like that, but I grew up low income. I do my best to keep up with the research in those areas too. So, you know, just from personal experience and reading that research, I'm fully aware of the, the, the issues with their, their statements. And, you know, while that's not a full expertise in what they're talking about, it's enough of one to know when they're screwing up. And I'm sorry, I just really think that it could have been done better. They should have at least acknowledged the fact that they weren't discussing certain things or that perhaps they didn't have the ability because they didn't have the numbers to discuss them. Um, and that just wasn't done. So yeah. And uh, this is a 10 minute video reviewing a book that I'm not sure anybody on here has read just because this kind of stuff doesn't usually get reviewed on booktube. So I'm hoping somebody has read it and will have a discussion with me. And if not, and you don't want me to talk about uh, these books I'm reading in class like this anymore, just let me know. I'd be happy to just, you know, get mad about it and discuss it with my wife. But <laughs> um, so yeah, that's all I had for today. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.